Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Kate Campbell, welcome to this very special market update. It is wonderful to be back on. Yes. Today we're going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking about the market and what's happening in the world of investing, whether you're talking about property, whether you're talking about household budgets. Uh, we're going to talk about what's been happening in our portfolios. So that will be towards the end of the update. And we also have a few timeless lessons for people. Yes. So our investors often want to know what are the key headlines, what are the key pieces of information they need to know from what's happened over the past month, because there are so many headlines out there, so many numbers, but often we don't need to know most of them and we don't need to action them. So this episode's all about pulling out what's actionable for you, what insights you need to know, and giving you a few practical things to think about over the next month. Yeah, that's right, Kate. And one of the things that we have an issue with here at RASC is that whether people are a member of our RASC core service or an investor directly with us, um, you can find out more about those in the show notes. But whether you're listening on a, the Australian Finance Podcast, the Australian Property Podcast, whether you're reading our newsletters, you have an account, you're a student, there's so much that we do. And a lot of people just want kind of one update that helps them understand what's happening across all of those different things. And what do I really need to know? Because it can seem overwhelming. So that's the purpose of this episode, which we're hoping to do every month. And it goes across all mediums that we uh, have so that people can feel informed. And if you just pick one episode, dear listener or viewer or reader, wherever you're getting this, if you just pick one episode, we hope it's this one because this one gives you a kind of just a refreshing update on what's happening in the world of finance and investing. So you can kind of just get on with your business and choose the other episodes or other material that we produce uh, that may be more stimulating to you. But this one hopefully just cuts through that all of that noise and just gives you what you need to know. Yeah. And I know we wanted to start with 10 timeless money lessons because there is so much about our finances that never really changes. Sure, the apps change. Maybe there's a better broker offering a better deal. But at its core, investing stays the same. Yeah, it does. And many of you will be familiar with this update uh, that I give, this kind of updated list. Uh, it is available on the RASC Investment Philosophy page, which is available to everyone. It's on our website, rask.com.au. And after doing this for more than 10 years now and studying people, interviewing people, we've done a lot of work over the years, studying companies, different parts of the market, different things you can invest in. Uh, I've kind of come up with these 10 kind of rules for the way the investing world works so people can relate to them and they can kind of cut through all of the other theories and strategies and just see what we think about the world of investing and how things should be done. So apologies if you have heard this list, list before, but it is very valuable to anyone who is thinking about investing, who is thinking about investing for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years because these lessons are designed to be evergreen, to be timeless, and to help you construct an investment framework that will put you in good stead for the rest of your life. And they're also important reminders for all of us, whether we've been investing for 5, 10, 20 years, because often it can feel hard once you've been invested for a while, all of the fun excitement at the beginning has dissipated, and you've just got to keep the discipline going of investing every month, mm. following the plan, avoiding temptation. So listening to these will help you stay the course and stay motivated long term. For sure. So I'll just quickly go through them and you can refer to the RASC website or just send us an email if you wanted to learn more. So the first rule is that uh, capitalism works. So capitalism over the last four or five years tended to get a kind of negative connotation to it. And the best way I think that capitalism can be demonstrated is when you go and buy a coffee down the street, you obviously pay dollars or money for that coffee and someone else produced it for you. The only reason they do that is because there's an incentive for them to make it for you. People don't just hand out coffees for no reason. They do it because they earn a profit. And that is capitalism at work. And if we don't have capitalism, you can look at, say, like Russia or other countries throughout the world where there's been a horrible experience of massive inequality over the last 30 to 50 years to see why that does simply not work. And so capitalism is this idea of rewarding people who take risks in their careers, rewarding people who take risk in business and allowing them to accrue some sort of value because they solve problems for society and keep 
humanity moving forward. Uh, we bring up medical innovations. We've had COVID vac vaccines and these types of things that have come about because there is an economic incentive. But you need to be invested. You need to be invested to get exposure to that because there's no other way. Otherwise, if you're just a consumer of the economy and not an investor in it, you miss out on those gains. Mm. So capitalism with bumper bars works. Number two is that this is a, a play on Warren Buffett's famous words, that I believe the stock market is a vehicle for transferring wealth from the impatient to the patient. People who overtrade, people who try and approach the stock market as if they're waking up at 4 a.m. every day to tr trade the US markets, those people over the long run are giving their value to either the brokerage house that they're trading with, most likely, or other investors who are patient and just simply own the market or invest in businesses for the long haul. Because at its core, if you do believe in number one, that capitalism works, the way to benefit from that is not trying to time which coffee company is going to make the best coffee on a particular day. It's actually just owning the best coffee company and just holding it while it creates more coffees. Mm. And so that is, in essence, what Warren Buffett has done as a, over 50 years. And that is, in essence, what index investors do, is they don't try and time the market. They just go, okay, well, I'll just own all of the companies or I'll own most of them and just let them do the heavy lifting. And it goes against our psychology because we want things immediately. We want the instant gratification. Sure. We want to see the thing right now. But investing, we have to work against our monkey brains and actually think long-term, invest long-term, make decisions that aren't going to benefit us in the next day, week or month, but they're going to benefit us in 5, 10, 20 years' time, which is really hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, most people that listen to RAS podcast know that you're studying at the moment. Most people study when they're young because then they get the benefit of their study and their academic learning over decades. And if you think about that, like people often say that hex is such a bad thing and it goes up in price, like mostly younger people say that because they're in it. But in reality, when you pay for your study, you're effectively paying for the future gains that you will get from it. Again, that is effectively capitalism at work because you're paying for something that will bring you a benefit in the future. And so we see that patience pays more often than not. Uh, number three is that Basically, if you think about all of the budgeting books, all of the finance books, is that there's only really two words that matter, and that is accumulating assets. So as long as you are collecting things that are appreciating in value, you are going to be okay. And so a lot of people spend their time buying cars or buying fancy uh, items like clothing and these types of things, and they're effectively not assets. I mean, you can maybe make the case that a custom car from the 1970s is valuable and it's an asset it might go up. But in my opinion, an asset is something that pays you dividends and grows. It does both things. And so as long as you're regularly doing that, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you will be okay. Uh, and if you want to kind of read deeper on this, you can go back to Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad, where he talks about the quadrants. And basically, you want to use some of your salary to increase your assets that work for you while you sleep. Uh, and as long as you continuously do that, you will be okay. So less time spent thinking about which assets to buy and more time just spent actually buying the assets. And I think you talk about this a lot, Kate, when you talk about analysis paralysis, people fumbling over which brokerage account for months or years even, fumbling over which stocks or which ETFs to buy because there are hundreds or thousands. Don't worry about it. Just buy some and keep going. Yeah. And you can do really well buying ETFs. We talk about Australian and US ETFs a lot throughout all of the stuff we do at Rask. You don't need to find this really niche asset that no one's ever seen or heard of before. You don't need to find the next big thing. You can invest in things that have worked mm. over time and will continue to work over time. Yeah. When I crunched the numbers on 150 years of stock market data, I found that the average profits of companies on the United States Stock Exchange over 150 years increased between 6 and 7% per year. That's through the Great Depression. That's through periods of war. It's through periods of deflation, inflation, through different presidents, different prime ministers, different regimes, you know, Berlin Wall coming down, like all of these different things. And yet the, the stock market, because of the idea that capitalism works, has continued to do that. So I would just say less time thinking about what's going to happen next and more time actually just doing the thing that brings you confidence and conviction in your, in your long term. Uh, wealth creation. So number four, I'll, be, I'll speed up a bit, is that typically when it comes to investing, the fewer decisions you make, the better the outcomes. And I did a study on this many years ago when I was at a different uh, business. I, uh, I spent some time studying professional investors. And what I found was that typically the investors who restrict the number of uh, positions in their portfolio, they tended to do better. 
And I took that at the time to mean that, well, if we all just picked 10 stocks instead of 20, we would do better from 10 than we do from 20. Now, I've since learned more and discovered more about why that may not be the case all the time. But the, the simple idea is that if you treat investing and you treat what you do with your money as a scarce thing, something that you cannot just endlessly do, uh, I think what you'll find is you make a better decision. I'll give you a great example. I've never, I can't remember ever placing a stock trade on a mobile app. In fact, most of my brokerage accounts I delete. Um, and the reason is that we've got to a point now where user experience with investing or saving money is no longer a thing. Like you have apps, you have tools, but none of it really matters. In fact, we've probably gone too far and we should be making fewer decisions and slowing down. And I think since I've done that, I've had less stress and better outcomes from my investing. So the idea is that fewer decisions equal better decisions. But that doesn't mean you have to sit there all day and you know, kind of pick which broker or pick which stock. You can start and you, as you always say, you get confidence from doing. So I think just take your time treat it as if it is important, that decision you are making, and you will do better over time. And that's why automation has been such a powerful tool for our investing community, because it takes Mm. one of those decisions off your plate. You don't need to decide what you're investing in, what day you're investing, how much you're investing, because you set up your plan and you've automated it. Mm. So it happens in the background and it takes part of that mental load of thinking about investing off your plate. Absolutely, it does. And I think that's a point where we've got to now, whereas you can go out into the world of investing and you can be overwhelmed, which is a very common feeling, by 50,000 different things to invest in. And that's not hyperbole. There are some platforms that offer you 50,000 different things to invest in, when really you only probably need five to 10 ETFs. And then if you want a satellite position around the outside, you can do that too. Um, so there, this, this is going to seem like a very trite or very, uh, I guess, just shallow remark. But diversification is one of the most important things in investing. Now, everyone says this, but I don't actually think that most people who say it truly understand why it works. So most people think that diversification is the don't put all your eggs in one basket. Now that might apply, but imagine if those eggs could grow into something and grow into something beautiful. Maybe you could say a chicken's beautiful. I don't know about that, but let's say if you did, right? The idea is that diversification works for two reasons. Number one is it spreads your eggs. So if you drop the baskets or the eggs fall out or whatever, you do have some left over. Now that's fair enough. You don't want to own all investment properties on the same street that's prone to flooding, for example. However, diversification has has one really meaningful other benefit. The other meaningful benefit is that you don't know which stocks or which stock markets are going to perform best at any one time. You don't know which bond markets are going to perform best at any one time. You don't know which commodities, which whatever. You never know exactly for sure which markets or which investments are going to do well. So what diversification does is it gives you a small bit of everything. That's the essence of it. So not only does it lower your risk, but it also gives you exposure to the things that you might miss if you are not investing in those uh, because you're so concentrated on something else. And I'll give you a great example. Uh, Let's say, for example, that you believe that uh, lithium is the future of investing because it goes into batteries, right? You might be right, but in the meantime, something else might have done better. And so by not having both markets, you've actually missed out. Even though lithium's done well, there might be something else like copper, just as an example. Uh, And so Diversification has two benefits, one for risk and the other one by enabling you to have a small amount of a good thing. Because a small amount of a good thing is a good thing, but a small amount of a bad thing is also a good thing because it limits your downside. Um, So those two are kind of lessons five and six. Number seven, and this is related to that point, which is that, and this is very well established through Professor Bessenbinder at the University of Arizona. Uh, He showed over time, over different markets, over different categories, that basically less than 5% of all companies on the stock market do all of the growth versus bonds. So bonds are normally defensive. So he's saying basically that only one in 20 at best is the one that does all the lifting for all of the other 19 to beat bonds. And so if you think about that, we go back to the point about diversification again, you could try and pick that winner and some people do. And I love to try and find those companies. But the reality is most people can't. So in that instance, you're best off being diversified 
and then focusing on the satellites. But it's also satellite. why even when you do invest in individual businesses, you never just invest in one single one. You have yeah. 10 to 20 individual businesses in your portfolio on top of diversified ETFs that give you exposure to stock markets across the world. Absolutely. And I've been very blessed that um, I've owned some of the best performing companies, like directly individual shares here in Australia. Um, in fact, I... I looked recently and of the top 10, I think I owned four or five of them over many years. So I did exceptionally well out of those. I didn't get all of them, but I got a lot of them. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. But the problem is in order to do that, I had to invest in probably 50 or 60 other companies to find those. Now that's fine, but this is me as a professional investor. A lot of people aren't professional and they don't do it nine to five. So I dedicated my life to it, literally my life to it. right? And that's as good as I could get. And David Gardner from The Motley Fool in the US often talks about this, that if you get those four or five correct, they will outweigh the other 30 or 40 that you own. But the, the reality is that's not for everyone because not everyone can find those companies, firstly. But second of all, this is the big one. Most people can't hold them. Because they don't go straight up, Owen. You often have to see them go down significantly before they go up. The, oftentimes, the best performing companies are the ones that are the most volatile. And this goes back to the original idea of capitalism because- in order to do something that stands out, you have to risk what you have. And you have to do that in business too. So the best companies are the ones that cause the most friction, the disruptors, the companies that come and kind of usurp the status quo. They might cause friction in the political ranks. They might be pulled in front of a Senate committee for open AI, for it example. It might be a product they, recall. They, it could be anything. And you have to be, as an individual shareholder, prepared to hold that. But the reality is most people can run Warren Buffett's rules over a stock market or try and find individual businesses that seem great. But the reality of actually holding them is very, very different. And that's where most people fall down. So I've got a couple more before we move on. So just in quickly uh, as a rule is an investing edge is something that kind of helps you to do well over the long term. And historically, there have been three accepted edges. So some people believe that they have like a better analytical ability. In fact, their IQ is very high. They're smart. They're good analysts. They're good investors. They can see things before other people can see them using the same data. It's kind of like, you remember that old thing when you're a kid, you used to kind of draw by joining the dots mm. or draw by number. Effectively, everyone's drawing by number, but the person who can see what it is first in that picture is the one who wins. That's typically what we, what we think about in the stock market. Everyone gets the same data. Everyone gets the same announcements. Everyone gets the same information. And they just got to piece it together quicker than someone else. So that's the analytical ability, but there's also the time. In, in the 1980s and 1990s, stockbrokers were allowed to be on investor calls. So like with BHP or with Telstra, they'd just sit and hear from the, the management teams. But that was never open to people mm -hmm. on the outside, just to regular investors like you and I. That changed uh, overseas and then it changed here pretty quickly. And basically what it meant is the people who had information in advance, which is now illegal, couldn't make money from that. So there was a time advantage. More recently in the last 10 years, there have been particular financial firms that have set up their buildings right next to the stock exchange buildings so that they could get a direct connection to the stock exchange quicker than someone else and try and high frequency trade. Some stock exchanges cut that out. Some don't say what their policy is, but basically they're trying to front run your little trade. Mm. Um, that's no longer a thing. So basically, of the three edges that someone can have to invest and grow wealthy, the best one is behavior. Your ability to withstand the blows of what happens in the stock market, to build a portfolio, to what, to keep adding money no matter what your life throws at you, those are the people who have an advantage. Those are the people who have an edge. And that's probably the last edge that anyone can have, is coping with the difficulty, coping with uncertainty, and most importantly, investing with an optimistic bias when everything around you is negative. Those are the things that will put you in good stead. It's very hard to stand here and say, or sit here, I'm seated, I believe the world is becoming a better place. And then on, you flick on the news and you hear something about a president from the US doing something crazy, or you see uh, like a, something bad that happens on the street in Sydney, or you hear a story about a CEO that does something wrong, or you know, there's something going on in Africa. Like, there's so many things in the world that are negative, 
And then there's the one person that sits up there and says, it's actually getting better and I'm okay with that. It sounds crazy because things can be bad and getting better. And so I think that if your behavior is biased to optimism, you will do better because you're willing to deal with those blows. And it's often the thing we don't spend any time working on. So often we're trying to choose the best broker and the best Mm. ETF and the best company, but we don't think about our behavior and how we're making decisions. We've talked a lot about decision-making processes in the past. Like There's a great book called How to Decide by Annie Duke Mm. that actually lays out a framework that you can assess your decision-making skills because we often go, oh, our investment performed really well, therefore I'm a good investor. And we don't explore that process behind how we made the decision in the first place. So we might learn the wrong lessons. Yeah, so true, Kate. I think one of the best things that can happen to an investor early on is actually lose money. A lot of people you know, come into investing and they might have a really good stock or a really good pick and they do really well. And they've picked it based on speculation of what they've heard someone say or they read a headline or something like that. And if you pick an investment and it does really well earlier on, that can actually be more dangerous for you because the next investment that you make, you could use the same process, which is not based on skill, as in the case of Annie Duke's book. It's actually based on something that is quite dangerous and you actually end up losing more money. And then naturally, if you've made your first investment, it's done really well. You don't know why, but it's done well. So then you invest more and it's done if it's done really poorly your natural reaction is going to be that the stock market is like gambling if you've heard that phrase it's from people who lost money and they don't know why the reality is no one can give you certainty in the stock market so what we do is we kind of cling to these really shallow ideas of lithium this thing goes up and really in order to understand why the stock market does what it does you need to have like a whole of view picture you need to understand that the stock market is actually like the result of millions of different inputs and millions of different outputs. What's going on in the economy? What an individual investor is doing today? For example, let's say both of us are looking at Telstra shares. You go in and place a trade, that might actually push the stock down. I didn't know that. I didn't know that Kate Campbell was responsible for pushing the share price down and I bought it anyway, which I push it back up. So all of a sudden you can see that there are two influences that neither of them are related. There was some famous... Um, anecdotes that come out of one of the world's best hedge funds that basically suggested that if you trade the Paris stock market on a sunny day, you will do better. Most of us wouldn't know that, right? And so the stock market is this kind of pit of randomness in the short term, but in the long term, it's actually this place where eventually it becomes a weighing machine where the best businesses continually make the best coffee or continually make the best widgets and they'll make more and more money. And so that's why when you study the stock market, all of the finance industry will tell you to look over three, five, or 10 years. Don't look over one year. Don't look over one week. Don't look after over a day. And definitely don't look over a minute. Um, So this brings me to my ninth point is most people shouldn't own individual stocks. Laid it out pretty easily. Why? If you do own individual stocks, it should be a smaller part of your portfolio unless you're doing it as a professional, unless you're approaching it as a professional because you don't have the time. Most of us don't have the time to do it full time. Most of us don't have the curiosity, frankly, like most of us don't really care. Most of us don't have the inclination or the ability and the willingness to get back on the horse when we get kicked off. And so unless you have lots of time and inclination and the curiosity to keep going, and approach it more like a scientist than like a emotional creature, individual stock picking won't work. So I think if you're going to do it, do it as a, the satellite of your portfolio and keep the core of your portfolio in ETFs or diversified investments. Number 10, and this is the last one that I'll say, uh, is you do not need to choose as an investment thing, we just create these fake rules these false choices, and we're almost presented with, I'm a stock picker, I'm a value investor, I'm a growth investor, I'm an index investor, I'm doing fire, I'm not doing fire. We love putting everyone in a box. Everyone has to be in a box. And you don't have to do any of that. You can be your own individual beautiful self, and you can invest however you want to do it, right? Because we're all unique creatures. And I think the more of these artificial choices you put in front of yourself, the more difficult investing is going to seem. And the biggest one in investing is clearly whether you're an index investor or you're an active investor, passive or active. But most people are doing a bit of both these days. And they should. Most people should have index investments and they should have stocks and they should have property and they should have cash and they should have 
all those weird and wonderful things that they put their money into, like cryptocurrencies or art or a business, those things are great as long as they're contained. And those things are great to do because if you don't do them, you'll die wondering and you won't be satisfied with what you're doing with your money. So do them, but do them in moderation and have the core of your portfolio be in what is proven. It's pretty simple. That's the 10. Quite a few other things in there, Owen. It is a very big one for today, and I do apologize. There is one final thing that I might add. Yeah. Because this is something I did want to add to the first market update. Like, this is the kind of first all of Rask market update. And this is the thing that I want to leave people with. I was asked a few years ago, I think it was just before COVID, hey, Owen, what would be the one thing that you invest in for 20 years and you can't sell it? And I took a few weeks to think about this before answering it on the podcast. And they said I couldn't invest in an index fund because that's the obvious choice. The reality is if you have a 20-year horizon, ask yourself what would be the most important thing? I think if you were investing for 20 years, the number one thing that you would want is something that's still going to be around in 20 years. Not You're not going to try and pick the next Apple or the next Netflix or NVIDIA. In fact, even just me putting that here on the record will make me look like a fool in 20 years because people will be saying, what's NVIDIA or what's Apple or what's Netflix? That's what they might be saying because 20 years ago, NVIDIA wasn't much of a thing. People were talking about it, but not really. Netflix wasn't a thing. We did not have iPhones. Yeah, exactly, right? So if you are genuinely considering investing for 10, 20 or 30 years or the next generation, you have to invest in something that's anti-fragile. And this is not a Nassim Taleb book. I haven't actually read his books. Um, But to me, anti-fragility is this idea of something that can't break. And the way something doesn't break in investing is something that can evolve with the market as it matures or as it moves. And it just so happens that the two best things that I can think of that do that, one is an index fund and number two is a conglomerate. So, Number one, an index fund. If you go back to the year 1900, railroads made up most of the US stock market. So if you got the whole of the market, you would find that a lot of it is railroads. If you go all of a sudden, you fast forward 100 years to the year 2000, you will find that it's a little bit of oil and gas and that sort of thing and energy, but a big part of it is technology. If you do it now in 2024, you will find that the overwhelming majority of like positions have some sort of technology enabled asset or feature to them. A lot of the biggest companies in the world are technology. In 100 years or 30 years or 20 or 10 years from now, we don't know what that is. So in order to capture what the future may hold, you have to be diversified. An index fund is the best way to do that, as long as it's diversified enough. The second part about conglomerates, I'll be quick. A conglomerate is basically just an index fund, but it happens to be a company instead of an an ETF or a trust. And they typically, as long as they're run by people who are shrewd, they can work. And so there have been some of those in existence in Australia, like Washington Hate Sold Pattinson for over 100 years. Was that what you ended up picking? It is actually on that show because they said I couldn't use index funds. Um, other businesses like, say, Wes Farmers, which owns Bunnings, used to own Coles and all that sort of stuff. That's been around for decades. Um, other businesses like Affic or Argo, which are listed investment companies, they've been around for decades. Because those businesses and those things are actually set up that they're not one thing. They're not betting on AI, they're not betting on lithium, they're not betting on something. They're diversified in themselves. And so that adds the element of anti-fragility. And I use the example that it's just evolution in the stock market. Uh, if you're a biological person, that's what it is. Yeah. We're all made of biological materials, aren't we? Well, yeah, well, we are. And um, if you think about it, an evolution of the stock market over the past 124 years has been no longer are railroads the most valuable thing in society, now it's technology. In another 124 years, I don't know what that will be. So I want something that casts a net wide enough that it captures whatever may come next. And at the moment, an index fund is the best way to do that. So that's it. So that's it. That's That's all we need to know about investing. That's the educational lesson. And you're probably wondering, why is this such a long-winded rant from Owen? And the reason is that this is the first proper all of Rask market update Kate and I wanted to do. And I wanted this on record so that in five or 10 years, you can look back on this episode and you can be like, that helped me. Or of the 10 things, he was wrong wrong on these three or four things and the other six or seven were pretty good. We love having things on record to hold ourselves to. (laughs) Yeah. So now we'll move into something that's a little bit more this month, this quarter, what's happening right now. Okay. Well, 
Owen, what's been happening in the world of finance economics this month that we need to know about? So I've got a few quick things that I'll update you on. Um, and this is for a lot of this is taken from uh, Pete Wargent. So Pete Wargent is our host of the Australian Property Podcast. But Pete is also our consultant for our analyst team. So he writes these monthly updates for our members inside Rascore. And his focus is on property. Yeah, his primary focus is on property, but he also has been well, so well versed on doing this for decades that he covers a lot of different things and he consults to other places. And so given the fact that he works with us for the podcast anyway, he makes the ideal person to work on these types of things with our team. And so just some quick updates. Uh, one of the things that Pete focused on this month was that office, office vacancy rates are still quite high. Uh, and this is a concern for anyone that owns property because if there's fewer people in there, it means rents will fall, which means the valuations should fall. Now, people have been saying this for like a decade, but we are now starting to see that vacancy rates are very high. And in property investing circles, for people who are in commercial property, so this is not like you go and buy one, two, three, Kate Campbell Lane. It's like you go and buy, you know, the 300 uh, room or 300 office suite tower in Melbourne, for example. For those people that own those through real estate investment trusts or ETFs or their managed funds or through their super, those are the properties that are vulnerable. And in those, it's not like the really beautiful properties. It's what we call the tier one assets. It's kind of, or the A grade properties. It's the next ones down, like the the strip mall or the the regional shopping center, those are the ones that are going to fill this the most. Um, and, you know, we can see that vacancy rates are already quite high because of COVID, everyone now works from home. This is not an Australian thing. And no matter what political agenda or corporate agenda someone is pushing for us all to come back to the office, this is the new way that businesses run online. And that is the reality. So, um, just something to be mindful of is that we might see more pain before gain. Um, number two and number three are about interest rates. So for those of you that don't know, basically what we can do is we can use the bond market as an indication of where interest rates will be in the future. And it typically looks one year out. So depending on where bonds tr are traded, that, de that determines where interest rates should be in three, six, 12 months time. Now, what's happened in the last two or three months is people thought interest rates were going to fall. And that's why banks started offering you lower term deposits and may even have been a bit more flexible with locking in lower rates of interest on your mortgage. But now, thanks to a few changes, particularly in the US and then here in Australia, some data, it looks like interest rates may not fall until the second half of the year. So we're seeing extreme mortgage stress. I think Pete quoted an update from, uh, I think it was from Roy Morgan, um, which showed that estimated there are 1.6 million stressed home loans as of January, 2024. And that is with close to 1 million mortgages now classified as extremely at risk. So there's a big red chart, it looks quite scary. Basically, we're heading towards a period where homeowners in Australia and investors, probably more so investors to be honest, um, almost as stressed as they were during the GFC. Mm. And I know you, we're going to talk more about like what that means in terms of stress and everything that's why we exist. But the reality is that that is now starting to show up pretty fiercely in the data. And it would suggest that even though I say interest rates may be cut in the second half of the year, and no one knows for certain, by the way, so don't bank your whole life savings on that. What it may suggest is if things get worse quickly, the Reserve Bank in Australia will cut interest rates quickly. Um, and so there are two results of that. One is if interest rates fall quickly, you can expect your bond ETFs to go up, not down. They've gone down recently. I'll cover that in a minute. You can expect your stock market ETFs to go up. The reason is because if interest rates fall, businesses can borrow money for cheaper as well, which is good. And then more people are willing to invest. Mm. So that's probably the three major economic updates is be careful of office properties. If you're an investor in those, it's quite a niche thing, but just be aware of it. Um, same probably applies to residential property. I hear a lot of people getting out of them. Number two is that interest rates across the board look likely, but not certain, to fall in the second half of the year, or at least that will be the conversation that people are having. And I guess the, the, the key inside of all of this is financial stress is here. We've talked 
in these updates or similar updates, Kate, in the past of household savings ratios going way down and dipping nearly to zero across Australia. As they dip to zero, severe stress will unfold. And that's not necessarily like Armageddon, like grab the shotgun and the baked beans and head for the hills. It is just to be realistic and start focusing on your budget, to start focusing on your employment and keep or be ready to invest when the time is right. Because there will come a time when it is right and prices are uncertain. Again, that optimistic bias does kick in. Yes. And it's super important to have those foundations set, as you said, Owen. Yeah. Getting out of nasty debts, getting our emergency funds sorted, making sure we've got a float for any unexpected things that come up, and also focusing on education. If you can't invest as much at the mm. moment, take that time to learn. Yeah. There are a lot of, quote unquote, people locked into their mortgages. That's what I'll call it. Um, people who cannot refinance because the value of the loan is higher than they can put into a borrowing power calculator. There are a lot of people who are really worried about their jobs right now or will be in the next three months. Try now to make yourself invaluable. Try now to build those that, that cash balance that Kate's talking about. That might be selling stuff, might be getting rid of the boat that sits in your driveway. It's probably a note for me. Um, it might be um, just being more realistic in your discretionary spending. It might be having a money conversation or a money date with your partner. It might be you know, working with some friends to do a rental together rather than have a single rental. Um, these types of a, of a thing to help you get through and survive, but also thrive even under some pretty potentially tough conditions. Yeah. And every small action you take with your finances does matter and it does add up. So even if it feels overwhelming to take action, if you just say, what is one small task I'm going to do this week? And then focus on that. And then next week you can pick something else. So don't try to do everything at once. But I would encourage you to be active about working mm. on your finances and not passive. Don't let things happen to you. Try and be at the forefront of things. Yeah, I think it's um, it's definitely one of those things where people can be like the emu and stick their head in the sand. Um, and that may work for the very short period of time. And to be honest, realistically, some people should just shut out the negativity for a moment and maybe step away from your device or step away from the bank statement and just go and get some fresh air and some sun on your skin. But the reality is doing that longer term doesn't work. So actionable change will make a difference. And that means things, you know, that may force you to be A, creative or B, to kind of just stomach an uncertain position or an unfavorable position for a little while until you're out of it. And there is always help available if you are in financial stress. Absolutely. You can call the National Debt Helpline and talk to free financial counsellors. So that's an independent confidential service that if you're struggling with debt, they can help you. They can find options. Mm. They deal with the bank. They advocate on your behalf and they know all the laws. And it's free. It's, it's wonderful. So that's a free service. Um, it's a National Debt Helpline. They can help you connect with a financial counsellor. So uh, just shifting gears now, a lot of our members and investors wanted to uh, wanted us to start doing monthly updates, which we have to do now as part of our new investment service. So um, people deserve monthly updates. I don't like doing really detailed monthly updates for our investors because I actually think it has the opposite effect of if you're zooming into one month, I think that's too short term, but we do it and we're hoping that this podcast and this video can help you understand what's happening recently and let you know that we're not just asleep at the wheel. We all see, we all see the things, but we just give you the updates that really matter. Um, so uh, I thought a way to do this and to illustrate it for our members and for our community is to actually focus on one of our portfolios. So we run this strategy called Jupiter. It's one of our three strategies. Jupiter is a 90-10 strategy, meaning that it's 90% in growth and it's 10% in defensive. So Jupiter is more designed for long-term investors, people with five, 10, 20 year time horizons like myself. And then they might slowly add other positions around the outside or they might you know, invest in other ways, but for their core portfolio, they're interested in growth and reinvesting that growth for the long-term gain. So in the last little while uh, across the ETF portfolio, that's only ETFs inside this, whether it's active or passive, an ETF can actually have an active strategy for those of you that don't know. Um, so the portfolio has performed pretty well this financial year, um, sorry, this calendar year. Uh, things are kind of 
actually really positive. Uh, and that's really good to see. The only massive detractor was actually that the gold, uh, sorry, the we, we have a position in a very small position in cash. And a lot of people look at the cash ETF from BetaShares, AAA is the name of the ETF, full disclosure. It's something that we recommend, obviously, because it's in our portfolio. Uh, the AAA ETF kind of looks like a shark tooth. If you look at the the share price, it goes up and it falls, it goes up and it falls, it goes up and it falls. And it kind of looks like a shark tooth along the way. And so when you look at the performance of that, what you're doing is you're just looking at the monthly income payments. So when you find that ETF in your portfolio, it's because it's for income only. It shouldn't really grow like bottom left to top right in the share price. It should just kind of go up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's what that's designed to do. So that produces an income, but it actually can look negative if you look at it at one month performance. So just keep that in mind. The best performer in our ETF portfolio by far is the IVV ETF, which tracks the S&P 500. The IVV ETF is unhedged. And we talked about this last month, but basically what that means is the currency impact, whether that's positive or negative from the US dollar going up or down, is going to impact this ETF. And the best way to kind of see that is the actual ETF has returned 12% for investors this year as of March 4th, 12%. But the index, the S&P 500 index, has only returned 8.3%. So that means there's around about 3.7% that's just come from the Australian dollar falling because the US dollar gets more valuable. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's a really good uh, way to illustrate the difference between currency hedging and not. If you didn't currency hedge, uh, sorry, if you currency hedge, like if you pick an ETF that says currency hedge in the title, you won't get the benefit or the weakness from the uh, from the actual hedging. So the NASDAQ ETF is up 12.7% this year. The index itself, 10.6%. The ASX 200 is up 1.5%. The actual dividend including index, so like the index that also includes dividends, is up 2.6%. So you see that there's an extra 1% already this, this year. Already this year, there's an extra 1% just from the dividends which is pretty impressive. The Chinese market is down 1.1%. The Australian bonds are down 0.5%. Global bonds are down 1.4%. And that's because those bond ETFs are down. The two biggest bond ETFs in the country are IAF and VBND. The reason that those two are down is because people expect interest rates to stay higher now. Whereas in December, they expected them to fall sooner. So some people think that bond ETFs I know this is in the weeds, Kate, but some people expect bond ETFs to do better when interest rates are cut, right? And yes, that can be the case, but sometimes it depends on what the market was already expecting. Remember how I said before that the market expects interest rates to be cut this year? That is enough, that expectation to change the bond price, mm. not necessarily whatever happens. It's what people expect. So it's a forward-looking yeah. Performance so figure. the value of a bond ETF today and what it does today is not necessarily just because whatever interest rates are today. It's because what it is expected in three, six, nine, or 12 months. Yeah. That's typically the way they react. Um, cash, I think you and I covered the other day, you can get a an ING savings account or a term deposit, still around 5%. No, no affiliation with ING, it's just an example. But uh, you could do Macquarie, Rabobank, whatever. Um, but that's pretty good if you're a retiree still have your money just parked in some cash. Term deposits, I'd be locking those in, at least some of them. Uh, gold is up 3.44%. That's the NUG ETF. Bitcoin is up 43% in US dollars. So you get the US dollar impact, which is positive, but you also get Bitcoin going up. And it's interesting that is impacting the news cycle, suddenly starting to see articles about cryptocurrency coming back in again. Yeah. So I say uh, on the show, Bitcoin in US dollars is up 43%. One of our many dear listeners opens up Google and goes, Bitcoin price, looks at the, the chart, there's an article that matches that wonderfully. It says, here's why the Bitcoin price is up. You click on it, it's probably a Bitcoin related crypto website, and it feeds on itself. So um, as you said before, resulting is what Annie Duke said in her book, uh, How to Decide. Resulting is you believe that your investment is a good, uh, good decision because it went up. But that has nothing to do with your decision making process. It just went up because X, Y, Z. So even though Bitcoin goes up in price, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good investment decision. Hmm. It's great if you own it, but if if you don't own it, it's not necessarily you made a bad decision. It just may be that it's gone up. Finally, 
The Australian dollar is at 65 US cents. Uh, I did the numbers just before coming on the air today. And since the year 2000, the average for the Australian dollar is 77 cents. So the average is 77 cents and it's currently at 65. So it's about 12 cents away below its average. And um, I'm going overseas soon and I'm not happy about the dollar being so low. Uh, because it makes my U- European holiday more expensive. Is this in comparison to a U- the US dollar? Yeah. So Australia is one of these, It's I think it's only one of two markets in the world where when we refer to currency, we refer to the Australian dollar. So it's the Australian in US dollars. So we would get 65 cents of US dollars. Right. Right. Most places around the world don't do it that way. It's just an Australian thing to go Australian dollar is... And when we say that, we always refer to the US dollar. But if we were to say Australian dollar, that could mean Australian dollar to euros. It could be Australian dollar to Thai baht. It could mean anything. But reality is when we say Australian dollar, we only mean to the US dollar. So we're measuring if we have more or less purchasing power in the US. Yeah. So, we if, say that. so if it goes down, we would have less in okay. the US. Um, so when people say the Aussie dollar or the AUD, it's always in comparison to the US dollar. When overseas, it may be compared to many different things, but it may also be expressed in the other currency first. It's just here in Australia, we do it this way, which is kind of easier to be honest. So in summary, bonds slightly down this year, stocks way up, and it's mainly because of the big tech stocks uh, and US stocks leading the charge, Asian stocks struggling, European stocks are doing okay. Um, Aussie stocks are just plodding along as they usually do. Um, and that's, that's, that's the wrap. So if you want to learn more, you can head to the RASC website. You can Google RASC Core. There's a link in the show notes for RASC Core, RASC Invest, all the different services that we offer. You can get in contact with us and leave us feedback. We answer questions, obviously, each and every week, depending on which podcast you listen to. There's a link in your show notes that says, ask a question. If you did like this update, please let us know. We do love feedback. We did get a lot of feedback on the first one we did on the Australian Finance Podcast, which is why we've broadened it. Kate, I know next month it won't be this long. I just wanted to make the first one very, very special with that that 10 kind of rules introduction because if anyone picks up next month or the month after or you share this with a friend we'll refer back to this one you, we'll refer back to this one so you know how we think about investing so overall things are getting things, better things things are getting better on the investing front on the financial front in terms of savings in terms of property things are pretty dire for people and i don't think that should be underestimated as in, I don't, I'm not here to predict that property price will fall. I don't actually think that, to be honest, for what it's worth, because we don't have enough houses and we've got too many people, um, which is a good thing. But I just think that if you have, if you haven't run your budget in the last three or six months, do it again now, because chances are your mortgage has gone up, your, your rent has gone up, your utility bills have gone up, your grocery bills have gone up. Do that budget now. And actually look at it and follow the steps that Kate always lays out basically every week or every second week uh, on the podcasts or on any of our co- in any of our courses. You can go and you can get a free course. Um, go and check those out. Speak to your mortgage broker if you can get a better deal, even just by asking your bank. As you said, Kate, speak to the hardship line or get a counselor to do it for you. The National Debt Helpline will help you. That's probably the 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 scary side, but on the investing side, everything is actually pretty good. As long as you're diversified, um, you don't have too much exposure to office properties, which not a lot of people do. Everything is good. Everything is good. And that's it. But we're all stressed. We're all stressed, <laughs> but things are good. So what's changed? It's all. It's more of the same. Um, and yeah, there's. you've got to be able to, as an individual investor, remember that your goal as an investor is not to make money every year. It's to achieve whatever big goal you have in the future, like early retirement, a million dollars in your super, you know, some equity in your home, whatever the case may be. Keep your eye fixed on the horizon. You can get a bit seasick on in markets if you just focus on the ups and downs of the day-to-day. Keep your eye fixed on the horizon. Focus on that, and that's where you're heading. If you do that, little bits lots of times, Kate, as you say. Wonderful. Well, Owen, there's a lot for everyone to take away from this market update, and I'm sure we'll have plenty more to add in next month's one. Yep, absolutely, Kate. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more. 